looking at something at 30,000 feet, um, you know, that's kind of getting like a, a bird's eye view. We're probably like, at, I don't know, 70,000 feet um, at this point, but um, we're going to do our best to, um, to give you as much as much as we can uh, for, for the books that we're going to cover today. We started this journey with Pastor Bob uh, covering the intertestamental period during that first week, um, you know, the period of time between the Old Testament and the New, uh, which covered about 400 years that, set up, uh, that separated um, the time of Nehemiah from the birth of Christ. Um, that time is sometimes called the silent years uh, because during that time there was an absence of prophetic revelation. Uh, but as we, lear- as we learned during our first week together, there were important historical and cultural events and changes that really shaped the world uh, of the New Testament. So week one, we covered that and the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, each covering the life and ministry of Jesus in their own unique and important way. Then last week, uh, Pastor Bob walked us through the book of Acts and then what we know as the, the Pauline epistles. Um, an epistle is simply a letter. And a Pauline epistle is a letter written by, by Paul. Um, so in Acts, we looked at the beginnings of the church, you know, uh, immediately after the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. And then the Pauline epistles were the letters that the Apostle Paul wrote um, to churches, right? Romans uh, and Corinthians, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, uh, Colossians, First and Second Thessalonians. And then he wrote a few letters to some individuals, First uh, and Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. So that leaves us with what are called the, the general epistles, which we'll cover tonight, and then the grand finale is going to be the book of Revelation, which Pastor Bob will be covering next Wednesday. Um, You definitely want to be here uh, for that. Um, I am very much looking forward to it. If you have vacation plans, cancel them. You want to be here for uh, Pastor Bob as he covers the book of Revelation next week. But again, tonight we're covering the general epistles, which are letters written to the church um, in the first century AD by apostles other than Paul. Um, And we're including the book of Hebrews, which really isn't an epistle and may or may not have been written by Paul, Um, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, So we're going to look at the book of Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd and 3rd John, and Jude. And if if, if you're familiar with these books, you know, Hebrews is, is, um, you know, a substantial book. Uh, James is about half that size. The rest of the books are, are, are kind of smaller, so it may feel like if you've ever been on a roller coaster, like the click, 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 and then by the time we get to the top, the rest of it's just gonna go uh, go really quickly. Um, but before we begin, I want to go over a few things that are important to keep in mind. Um, an important part of studying, of understanding, and interpreting the Bible is context. Um, context, it's it's the who, the what, the where, the when, and the why of what we're reading. So things like language and, and literary genre, um, what was happening culturally, politically, religiously uh, in, in a particular society. All these things help us determine the context of a passage we're reading. And it helps us to understand and interpret the passage correctly. Uh, but not uh, only do we have the immediate context of what we're reading, but we also have the context of that passage um, in its place in the entirety of, you know, the story of the Bible. In other words, what does this passage mean in light of all of Scripture? So, number one, when we're looking at context and interpretation, right, what does it mean um, to the immediate audience um, that it's being written to? Um, Next, we kind of take a step back and look at what it means in light of all of Scripture, the entire story of the Bible. And then finally, what does it mean for me? What does it mean for you? What is the application? Because, um, you know, when you're reading and studying God's word, after all, that, that is what you're looking for. That's what you want. Um, you know, what does this mean for me? We can't arrive there without understanding, first, what it meant. Second, what it means in light of all scripture. And um, because these letters, they weren't written to me. They weren't written to you. But they were written for me and for you. Uh, So a little context to start tonight. There's four types of people during this time. Four types of people during this time. Um, I'll just go over them really quickly. Uh, You have Jewish people who are non-believers, right? These are Jewish people who are are non-believers. They still, you know, hold to the law. They have not um, accepted, received, they don't believe in Christ as as the Messiah. Uh, And then we've got Jewish people who are believers. They're Christians. These are Jewish people who have come to know uh, Jesus, and now we've got Gentiles, 
that don't know Jesus. So Gentile non-believers and Gentile believers. So some of the events that happen and the way books are written are to different audiences. There are also four events that help Christianity spread, and this is, uh, this is going to be in your, in your notes. Um, and Pastor Bob touched on some of these over the last couple of weeks, uh, but just to kind of bring us all up to speed. Uh, again, four events that help Christianity spread. The first is a common language. A common language. Um, we talked about the Koine Greek. A Koine is a word that simply means common. Um, and as Alexander the Great conquered the known world, he spread Greek language and culture. So Greek became the most common kind of international language of the day. Um, you know, I was talking to someone just this, uh, this past weekend. They were in Barcelona, and they were telling me how on the street signs, you know, the street signs are in, um, you know, in Barcelona, even though it's in Spain, uh, they speak a different language, Catalan. It's a, it's a different culture. It's a different language. So the street signs are in Catalan or in Spanish and in English. And my guess is that if you go to a lot of places, you know, a lot of country, different countries around the world, you're going to see a lot of signs in that native language. And if you see another language, it's probably going to be English. So the same way kind of English is an international language uh, today, Koine Greek was an interna international language uh, of that day. Since most people could understand uh, this Koine Greek, it helped the spread of the gospel and Christianity. The second thing um, were the Roman roads. The Roman roads. The next empire uh, comes in after Alexander the Great and the Romans, you know, they, they're an advanced society and they built a reliable system of roads and infrastructure throughout their empire. You've heard of the saying, all roads lead to Rome. Um, this is the genesis of that because literally all roads that were built back then, you know, led to Rome. Uh, this is uh, this was done to be able to travel from city to city across their empire as it grew. And this facilitated the spread of the gospel. The third thing, the third thing we had um, was the persecution of the church. Number three and four are, are, are kind of similar, but um, the persecution of the church, this was the persecution that began in the book of Acts. Um, this was at the very start of, um, of Christianity. And last week, Pastor Bob spoke about Stephen uh, being stoned to death in the book of Acts. James, the brother of, of John, was also executed in the book of Acts. And this persecution was primarily by the non-believing uh, Jews, uh, the Jewish leadership and authorities that were beginning to persecute uh, Christians. And if you remember from last week, this was before believers were actually called Christians. They were called followers of the way. Uh, it wasn't until Antioch when they began, uh, they began to be called Christians as an insult. If you remember, you know, again, Pastor Bob talked about this. Um, Christian meant little Christ, um, and it was meant as an insult, and he took it as a badge of honor. Uh, so this persecution forced Christians to leave Jerusalem, and they left and found new places to live, and they would find or start a church. Um, just like if, if you had to leave Miami and move somewhere else, you'd, you know, find a new church uh, to be a part of. Um, so as people left Jerusalem because of that persecution, um, that helped spread Christianity as well. And then finally, number four, we have the diaspora. The diaspora. And this is um, in 70 AD, we have the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem um, by the Roman Empire. This was Rome's response uh, to the struggle of the Jewish people to accept Roman rule. Uh, so Rome, under the emperor um, Vespasian and his son Titus, came into the city of Jerusalem and they destroyed the temple. They didn't allow Jews back into the city. So the people that were dispersed uh, throughout the surrounding area and beyond, again, that helped to spread Christianity. So we're going to start tonight, again, with the book of Hebrews, um, kind of with just that contextual backdrop. And the theme of Hebrews is the superiority of Christ. The superiority of Christ. Um, so just some background on Hebrews. Of all the books that we're going to go over tonight, um, again, this one really isn't uh, an epistle. It's not really a letter. In fact, it reads more like a sermon. Um, you know, there's no salutation. There's no address um, at the beginning or at the end. Um, it is one of the two greatest theological books in the New Testament, uh, the other one being Romans. Uh, the author of Hebrews is unknown in, in, in the sense that, um, again, at the beginning, you don't have someone claiming to, to be the, the author of, of the book. Um, it wasn't signed like the other books. There are a few possibilities. Paul, the Apostle Paul, is, is one of them. Um, some scholars also believe that uh, it may have been written by his friend Barnabas. Barnabas was the one that kind of took Paul under his wing. Um, 
uh, early in his ministry. Uh, some consider a man named Apollos, who we also find in the book of Acts. This was a guy who was um, very adept at talking and, and arguing and instructing people. Um, we, when I say we, you know, I guess, you know, Pastor Bob, myself, us, we kind of land with Paul. Um, where you land, it really doesn't matter. It's not going to affect <laughs> the message. But we do believe it was Paul, and here's a few reasons why. Number one, as you read the context of Hebrews, you have to have a very complete knowledge of the Old Testament. And we know Paul was very knowledgeable in the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, the Bible tells us that he was a Pharisee of, of Pharisees. And um, let me just say this uh, about the Old Testament. Um, I don't know how many of you guys were with us last year, you know, when we covered, when we did this with, with the Old Testament. And, you know, right now we're in the book of Exodus. Um, sometimes for a lot of us, the Old Testament can be a little intimidating, a little scary. So we kind of ignore it. We look at the Bible, even though it's one book, we look at it as two completely separate things. Sometimes we even think that, yeah, the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament, I know it's the same God, but it's not really, you know, they seem like two different, two different people. The Old Testament was the scriptures of the New Testament authors. So when Apostle Paul talks about scripture, he's talking about the Old Testament. And um, an understanding of the Old Testament will change completely the way you see and understand uh, the New Testament. So if I can encourage you in anything today is to embrace the Old, the old Testament. Um, but again, for this book, you have to have a, a, a very complete knowledge. Uh, number two, the author also notes that he was in prison in Rome. And we know Paul was in prison around the same time that Hebrews would have been written. Uh, the author says he also, he's also known by Timothy and that Timothy is going to come to him. And we know Timothy to be considered um, Paul's son in the faith. Um, it also follows Paul's style of writing where he would do a lot of theology um, like in the book of Romans, kind of a lot of theology, and then the last few chapters would begin with application that would help us understand how we're to live out what he just taught. So the audience of Hebrews was Jesus, uh, Jewish Christians, Hebrews. Uh, Jewish Christians, Jewish converts to the Messiah. They believed Jesus was the Messiah. Uh, we also know it was written to Jewish Christians because throughout is, it is full of, of, of the motif uh, or the, uh, the theme of sacrifice and priesthood, all imagery from the book of Exodus and Leviticus. And the assumption is that the audience, right, the people that the author is writing to, I guess in this case Paul is writing to, that the audience has a working knowledge of this and an in-depth understanding of the Old Testament. So we have, what we have is these Jewish believers, and that, again, important to understand in terms of context, uh, these Jewish believers have come to Christ early in the history of the church and Christianity within the first 70 years. We know this because the temple is still standing. Um, uh, it's, it's before the destruction of the temple. So if you can imagine, again, now you're, you're putting yourself in, 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 the, in the shoes of these Jewish believers. Imagine being a Jewish believer while the temple is still operating. This is a symbol of everything you were taught not only to be true, but to be divinely appointed, right? You and your ancestors, you were God's chosen people, obeying his divine law. The, the priests, um, you know, they're still serving and ministering in the temple according to God's law given centuries ago. This is, this is what you've known your entire life. Uh, this, is, this is what inhabits your entire life. And now, as you realize the truth of the resurrection and receive and accept Christ as the Messiah, you are giving all that up, right? It's not like, you know, today when we come to Christ, maybe we're giving up, you know, our, our, our previous life. This No, imagine being a Jewish believer, um, still seeing sacrifices at the temple and being told that those aren't necessary anymore, but you've, for centuries the law told you that, that it was um, and, and because of this, you're facing persecution from the Jewish leadership and authorities. And you're thinking, man, maybe, maybe I, I, I can just go back to Judaism, maybe just for a little bit to kind of avoid this persecution. So they're slowly being pulled back and influenced by the other Jews saying, that are telling you, listen, Jesus doesn't fulfill the law. You're not doing all the necessary sacrifices. So Paul wants to do a couple of things. He wants to stop their doubts 
so they realize that Jesus is the right way, and then press them on towards maturity, right? He's saying, you know, I want you to grow. And this is Paul's audience and why the message of Hebrews is about the superiority of Christ. Uh, we can also say it like this, that Jesus is better. Jesus is better. And that's a theme throughout all of Hebrews. Um, a couple years ago, Pastor Bob did a series um, through the entire book of Hebrews, and the title of the series was Better, Jesus Over Everything. Um, if you're interested, uh, on our webpage, mycalvary.com, uh, under the, the tab for sermons, uh, you can search up that sermon series. It is amazing, an amazing study, the book of Hebrews. And again, it's called Better. So Jesus is better. And we get that right from the start um, in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. It says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, he has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person in upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged out sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they." See, throughout history, God spoke in many uh, different ways, and he used different messengers. He spoke through the angels. Um, in Exodus, he spoke through Moses. He spoke through priests. He spoke through prophets. And here it says in these last days, God has spoken to us by his son. It says that Jesus is better than the angels. And, and why, is he, why is that even important? Well, because angels were a big deal in Judaism. And basically what this is telling us is that not only is Jesus better than the angels, Jesus is just a better messenger than we've ever had before. Uh, in chapters 3 and 4 of Hebrews, uh, Jesus is better than Moses and the new covenant. He's better than Joshua who brought us, he brought them into the land but was never able to fully bring them into the promised land. Jesus was able to fully do that. And then we read that Jesus is a superior to Aaron and the priesthood. Um, and by that, we understand that Jesus is not only a better messenger, but Jesus is a better mediator. Um, the mediators of the Old Testament, right, the kind of the go-betweens of the Old Testament were the priests, the high priests. They stood before the people uh, to represent God and before God to represent the people. They mediated the covenant. And we read this in Hebrews chapter 4, uh, verses 14 to 16. It says, seeing then we, that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. See, in the old covenant, you couldn't go directly to God, right? Because of sin, you had to go to a priest. You had to bring an animal to sacrifice and atone for your sins. And the priest would represent you before God. But there was a problem. Not only were you a sinner, but the priest was a sinner as well. And he would have to offer a sacrifice for himself as well as for the people. But again, Jesus being without sin is now a better mediator, a better high priest now representing us before God. In chapters 5 through 7, uh, we begin to see the mentions of, uh, of a man named Melchizedek. And I, I want to talk about him just a, a little bit. Um, and this kind of highlights, again, the importance of, of, of an understanding of the Old Testament because uh, this is where you're going to see some things kind of connected dots between the Old Testament and the New. And we first see a reference um, uh, to Psalm 110 um, in Hebrews 5. Um, Hebrews chapters 5, verses 6 uh, to 11 makes a reference to Psalm chapter 10 where it says that, Jesus, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. What does it mean that Jesus, that Jesus is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek? Well, priests could only come from one tribe, the tribe of Levi. In, in, in the book of Numbers, we read that the priesthood began with Aaron and his sons, Jesus was not from the tribe of Levi. Jesus was from the tribe of, of Judah. So how could Jesus, not being from the tribe of Levi, become a priest? And not only that, kings weren't priests and priests weren't kings, right? These were two completely different 
uh, functions and, and roles. So who is this guy? Who is this Melchizedek? We first meet Melchizedek in Genesis 14. This is during the time of Abraham. So this is before Aaron and the Levitical line even began. This is way before. So to give a quick summary, Abraham's nephew, his nephew is Lot. He's living in Sodom and Gomorrah. And these four surrounding kings decide to attack Sodom and Gomorrah and take it over. And they take a bunch of people captive, including Lot and his family. And Abraham hears about this, and he grabs all his servants and is like, we're going to go take care of business, right? I'm going to go save my nephew. So he goes. He defeats these kings. It says that uh, on the cover of night, um, he's able to basically take back everything that they took, including the people, and he brings his family back, including Lot. Um, he's, he's weary from the battle. This is Abraham, and he's probably realizing, oh, man, I just went up against, you know, another f- four kings. Uh, but it says here that Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. So king of Salem, um, he is the king of peace. Um, Salem, that's where we get Jerusalem from. Um, so we see this in Genesis 14. This person just kind of show up, Melchizedek, a king, also a priest of God Most High. And it says that Abraham, recognizing Melchizedek as a priest, paid him a tithe. That's another way that you, you understand that Abraham knew that he was of um, a, you know, superior to him. Not as a king, but in this case as a priest. But again, the question, how can a king be a priest as well? In Psalm 110, which is a messianic psalm written by King David, Melchizedek is presented as a type of Christ. Um, and, and now in Hebrews, this theme is repeated. See, both Melchizedek and Christ are considered kings of righteousness and peace. And by introducing a priesthood in the order of Melchizedek, it is establishing a, a new and better priesthood than that of the old Levitical order and Aaron. So Christ's priesthood is superior. So not only is Jesus a better priest, but Jesus is a better sacrifice. See, the priests go and sacrifice daily for the people, right? You sin today, you go to the temple, and you bring your sacrifice. You sin tomorrow, guess what? You go to the temple, and you present your sacrifice, right? Each sin required a sacrifice. Jesus' sacrifice was once and for all. And, you know, Jesus isn't being sacrificed over and over and over again every time we sin. See, while the sacrifice of of animals covered our sin, the sacrifice of Jesus erased our sin. So Jesus is essentially the priest offering himself as a sacrifice. Now, a unique feature of Hebrews are the warnings that we get uh, throughout the book. And I want to take some time just to go through those warnings Um, And it'll be uh, in your notes. The first is the warning against drifting. (laughs) The warning against drifting. Hebrews 2, uh, verses 1 to 4, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, And every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. See, to heed, that means to to pay attention, right? And though... And through neglect, we can easily drift away by neglecting the word, by neglecting, um, you know, the, 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 the more or the less we pay attention to something, the more it kind of just becomes um, background noise to us. So it's a warning against drifting. Now, number two, the second warning is doubting, doubting the word. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in the parting from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, while it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. And again, speaking to a Jewish audience, 
um, who would have understood what he meant by do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion, he's reminding them of Moses and the Israelites going to the promised land, right, getting to the border and saying, all right, let's go, let's go ahead and check this out. And they send out 12 spies. And if you know the story, 10 come back, and they're like, there's no way. We can't go in. There's giants. It's not going to happen. Only two come back and say, hey, let's go. Let's do this. God is giving us this land. Those two were Joshua and Caleb. Again, the other 10 come back afraid, um, doubting God's word. Number three, the third warning is dullness. Dullness towards the word. Of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are full of age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from uh, from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptism, of laying on hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. You know, there's few things that frustrate me more than a dull knife. Um, I don't know if you've had this experience. Ever try cutting a tomato with a dull knife? Or you got a nice soft loaf of bread and your knife is dull? Um, you know, with a tomato, for example, it just slides back and forth. Right? It just stays on the surface, and it's just going back and forth, back and forth. That's what dullness towards the word means, right? We're just staying you know, on the surface, never going beyond what it says here, the elementary principles um, of Christ, going over the same things over and over and over again. Um, this, again, is a call to grow beyond that stage of infancy. If you are a new believer, like, I get it, you know, but some of us, you know, we've been a Christian, say, for 10 years, but we've really been um, a Christian 10 times just one year at a time. Um, so, again, this is a call to go beyond, um, uh, beyond that stage of infancy. Uh, the fourth warning is despising the word. Despising the word. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who was trampled who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace. This is a warning against despising and defying God. God is serious about his holiness. God's grace is not to be insulted. This warning, this is a warning of judgment. And then number five, departing from the word. Departing from the word. See that you do not refuse him who speaks, for if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. See, we tend to focus on our circumstances, but God wants our attention on him. Right? God is speaking to us through his word. He has something to say and something for us to learn. Uh, we get to chapter 11 of Hebrews, and this is known as, as the hall of faith. Uh, when you think of the Hall of Fame, for example, for, like the Pro Football Hall of Fame, right? It's, it's the best of the best. Um, for those of you uh, Dolphin fans, and if you're a little older, um, Zach Thomas is going to be inducted into the National Football Hall, League uh, Hall of Fame. So I guess for all two of us that are happy about that, all right? That's all we get for, for number 54. Yeah. Either you're a young crowd or we need some more Dolphin fans. Maybe if they start doing a little bit better, we'll get some more fans. But, listen, the Hall of Fame, it's the best of the best. Those that performed in a way that stands out above everyone else on the field. Uh, and, and this Hall of Faith, um, as it's known in chapter 11, is for the champions of the Old Testament, right? Recognized for, for their achievements as they followed God by faith. Success didn't come without suffering, yet they ran their race to the end. And as you read each account, you'll notice that each of these heroes of the faith acted on their belief in what God said, even though many would not see it or even realize it uh, in their life. And then um, the last verse I want to read from, from uh, Hebrews is in chapter 12, uh, verses 1 to 2. It says, therefore, we also, um, and actually these two verses come right after the hall of faith. 
Uh, so therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, those that came before us and by faith believed and stepped out are now cheering us on. They are our example. So the audience of Hebrews was wondering if following Jesus was worth it, if it was worth all the trouble, right, all the persecution. And Paul is saying, yes, it is. Keep going. Don't turn back. Jesus is worth it. And that's the message to us in the face of opposition, that Jesus is worth it. All right. Um, Next up, we have James, the, the book of James. And kind of the overarching theme of James is spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity. Um, so this is the theme of the book of James, that we would grow up and become more mature believers. Uh, the rest of the books we're going to go over tonight are named after the author, not the audience. Um, so... Um, I remember when my kids were born, um, and if you guys have, you know, have kids, you'll remember too, right? As they grew, they, they were, there were certain kind of like markers or milestones you expected to see from them, or at least you hoped to see from them. Um, you know, maybe it starts off with kind of just them rolling on their stomach, uh, grabbing things with their hands, making eye contact and recognizing you, um, eventually sitting up, eventually crawling, um, eating solid foods, beginning to say words. Uh, but once those milestones are reached... Now you're on to the next one, right? You're, you're expecting there to be kind of continual growth and advancement. Um, you know, and if I have a five-year-old that's still crawling and not walking, I'm going to recognize that something is wrong. You're expecting to see a progression. And spiritual maturity is the same. You know, in contrast to the book of Hebrews, which is doctrinally and theologically heavy, right? James is very much a, a practical book. Uh, it's written in a way, it's kind of like, Proverbs. Um, you know, if you're familiar with Proverbs in the Old Testament, James can easily be called Proverbs of the New Testament. It's, it's more instructional. It's kind of like, yeah, do this. You know, don't do that. Um, so this book is about taking believers who have, who have the basics down, right? The doctrine of the cross, the resurrection, uh, to take these believers to a place where they're now living out what they know. And one of the things I like about James um, is it's, it is straight to the point. It's in your face. There is no sugarcoating of the truth. Um, the author of James was James. Uh, in this case, uh, James is the, the half-brother of Jesus. A half-brother because they have the same mom, different dads. Um, and um, oddly enough, he became a disciple after the resurrection. So he's, Jesus is his older brother. He grows up with Jesus. Doesn't believe Jesus is who he claims to be until he sees him resurrected and it sounds weird but I have an older brother and if my older brother was claiming all these things and if every time something happened around the house it's like who did this it's like I know it wasn't Jesus had to you know let me guess me right um so I can understand how that's a a, a difficult you know dynamic um but he became a disciple after the resurrection and then became a leader in the church in Jerusalem. And that, if anything, should just speak to the power of the resurrection. Um, and if you can only imagine the people that, that witnessed it, uh, that were there, that saw it firsthand. Um, chronologically, it's, it's probably one of the first New Testament books. Um, he writes, it says that he writes to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. So he's writing to, to Jewish Christians living outside the land of Palestine, scattered throughout uh, different nations. And again, the book is focused on the practical aspects of the Christian life as it relates to spiritual maturity. Uh, James would contend that genuine faith produces genuine proof. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that um, as, as we continue. But again, genuine faith produces genuine proof. And we can look at five marks of spirituality, of, of spiritual maturity that we find in James. Um, so five marks of spiritual maturity. The first one is that spiritual maturity endures trials and tribulations, right? Spiritual maturity endures trials and tribulations. In James 1, uh, verses 2 to 4, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, 
knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but that patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And then a little farther down, uh, verses 12 to 15, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has, desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. See, trials and temptations are two things that will bring you pressure, right? Two things that bring you pressure in life, trials and temptations, but they are very different. See, God allows trials in your life. We live in a broken world, right? We are, just by virtue of being alive in this world, um, trials will come, uh, and they are allowed by God, and he uses them to mature you. Temptations, on the other hand, are not from God. They are from Satan to trap you and make you fall. Both are different. They, they come at you uh, from uh, uh, differently, uh, but you must endure both. And even though temptations come from Satan and he uses temptation against you, God can use it for you. The temptation used by God, I mean by Satan, can become a trial God uses to purify you. Uh, the second mark of spiritual maturity, uh, spiritual maturity is doing, not just hearing. Doing, not just hearing. All right? M mature Christians don't just know the truth. Truth, They practice it. Um, again, in James chapter 1, verses 22 to 25, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of a man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. And then in James 2, uh, verse 14, and then uh, verse 26, says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. See, what, what we learn from this is that real faith produces real fruit. And this is not a contradiction of salvation by faith alone. This isn't to be uh, you know, uh, confused with the idea that, um, that we have to work for our uh, salvation. All right, James is talking about, more than a, more than a contradiction, it's, it's a complement to it. James is talking about the fruit of salvation, which is works. What, what salvation and, and that faith produces. Paul, um, the Apostle Paul, when he talks about the root of salvation, he talks about the, that root being faith. So it is the root of salvation, right? The root under the ground that produces the fruit of salvation, which is uh, the works and, and the outflow of that faith. So your response to the truth reveals your relationship to the truth. Uh, the third mark of spiritual maturity uh, that we find is that spiritual maturity displays wisdom, not just words. Spiritual maturity displays wisdom, not just words. James 3, uh, verses 8 to 10 says, But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Similitude, that's a good word. That's like an SAT word. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not be so. And then James 3, uh, verse 13, and then verse 17. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. See, James highlights the, the power of the tongue. With it, we bless and curse. You know, have you ever told someone, you kiss your mother with that mouth, right? When, you know, um, right? we can do so much harm with our words. And it's not just what we say, right? Our tone, uh, our attitude, we can say the right thing the wrong way. Um, see, knowing, 
not just what to say, but how to say it without hypocrisy. That is wisdom uh, that comes from above. Uh, the fourth mark of spiritual maturity, spiritual maturity is, is marked by humility. It's marked by humility. James 4, 7 to 10, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. The verse right before this, verse 6, um, it wasn't in your notes, but if you want to just make a note. Um, right before it starts, it says, God resists the proud but gives grace uh, to the humble. And again, it is taking from the Old Testament. Humility is accepting who you are in light of who God is. And pride, pride is the opposite of humility. There is no relationship with God. When there is pride, pride is what got Satan kicked out of heaven. Um, when, when pride rules your heart, there is no confession. There is no forgiveness. There is no repentance. Pride is the enemy of God. And then number five, um, spiritual maturity persists in prayer. Spiritual maturity persists in prayer. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. See, pr prayer is the untapped resources, resource of the immature believer. We can't grow in our relationship with God if we are never talking to him. All right? So, um, from James, we go into 1 Peter. We look at 1 and, and 2 Peter. Um, but the overall, you know, theme of 1 Peter is enduring in persecution. Enduring in persecution. Uh, both 1 and 2 Peter were written by the apostle Peter. Um, and this is the Peter, he was the disciple of Jesus that we know that walked with Jesus. This is the Peter that we that was known for his boldness and his impulsiveness. Um, it's the Peter that that we know that also denied Jesus uh, before his crucifixion. But now he's a prominent figure in the early church. And as we saw in the book of Acts, um, you know the thing about Peter was at least to start he wasn't really you know schooled. Uh, he was a fisherman with his brother Andrew and his dad uh, when Jesus found him, which which meant that he didn't have what it you know, what it took um, to be taken under, you know, uh, kind of under the tutelage of a rabbi. So he kind of had just had to go into the family business. Um, and you contrast him with Paul, for example. Again, the Pharisee of Pharisees. He studied under the rabbi uh, Gamaliel, who was probably the most renowned rabbi of the time. Um, Paul was, by all accounts, an Old Testament scholar. And you would think that God would send Paul to the Jews and send Peter to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. But that's not what God did, right? He ends up sending Paul to preach to the Gentiles, and Peter is predominantly speaking to, uh, to, to, to the Jews. And God has always, God always has a way of kind of completely turning our understanding of how things um, should be and how they should work and just turning that understanding on its head. And he sees beyond what we can see, and when we put ourselves in his hands to be used by him how he wants uh, to use us he can do some amazingly unexpected things now this doesn't mean that peter did not grow in knowledge and understanding right if you're with jesus for three and a half years you're going to come out ahead um you're going to learn some things and when you read first peter from the beginning he hit some very deeply theological issues things like divine election and the trinity uh, so this letter First Peter uh, was written around uh, 64 A.D. Uh, this was around the time of a very key event um, in Rome, uh, known as the Burning of Rome. Um, you know, a lot of the public buildings in Rome were set on fire, and many historians believe uh, it was done by the Emperor Nero uh, himself that he set his own city on fire. So he loved to build things. He loved new buildings, and Rome was an old city. Everything was already built, and he figured the only way to build the city like I want is to kind of burn the current one. Um, obviously, that's not a good look. Um, so what Nero does is he blames the Christians for the fire and basically says, 
the Christians are the one that set the city on fire. And, and, and they became his scapegoat, and that's what kind of, you know, kick-started and set off the widespread uh, persecution that went on for 200 years. Now, we're going to get to Second Peter, but Second Peter would be written a few years later, around 68 A.D., and in chapter 5, at the close of the book, it mentions Babylon as the place where Peter was writing from. Um, this could be actual Babylon, as there were many Jews that stayed there after the 70 years of captivity. Or some think that Babylon was simply a code name um, for Rome in New Testament times. And again, this is the time right before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Things were getting heated um, the Roman persecution of Christians was in full effect. So Peter is writing these letters during very volatile times. And as we mentioned before, this would lead to not only Christians leaving for their safety, but also being forced out of Jerusalem into the surrounding nations. Uh, so this letter, 1 Peter, is addressed to the pilgrims of the dispersion. That's how, that's how he, he phrases it, the pilgrims of the dispersion. Um, and again, the theme is enduring in persecution. So to that audience and to us, the message is, you are going to suffer. But as a believer, you are called in part to suffer for his name's sake, for God's name's sake, right? Because suffering for the right reason, not the wrong reason, we all suffer. And we can suffer for, pretty, for doing some pretty, you know, stupid things on our own. If you're going to suffer, make it for the right reason. Uh, in 1 Peter 1, uh, verses 6 to 9, it says, uh, In this you greatly rejoice, Though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, and the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love. Though you now do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of of your souls. He's really trying to encourage uh, his audience, right? You're going through a lot, but remember, your faith is more precious than gold. Press on. Don't lose faith. If you keep persevering, you're going to be with Jesus, right? The salvation of your souls, it's all worth it. Take heart in who you belong to and where you are going. So he's encouraging them, trying to focus them and remind them of what's important because you know what it's like when you're going through it. Um, you know, facing trials of your own and all these other things kind of you know, rise up and become more important uh, in our minds. These things take our eyes off of Jesus, off of eternity. And Peter is, is reminding them of their faith, and he wants to remind them of their Christianity and what it looks like. In chapter 2, he talks about submission, submission to uh, authorities and to the government. And Peter is saying, listen, as much as you can, um, you know, obey civil government. You know, but of course, th th there's a caveat to that, right? Because being a good Christian means... Being a good citizen until being a good citizen means being a bad Christian. Um, and that's something that we all have to wrestle with, but we'll leave that there. Um, Peter shows how they're to live the Christian life at home uh, with servants uh, in, um, in chapter 2, verse 18, between husbands and wives in chapter 3. And in chapter 3, verse 8, he sums up all those roles and he says this, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, Love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. And then down to verses 16 to 17, he'll say, having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. He goes on to talk about how Christ suffered. And listen, the Bible never promises your best life now. It promises your best life is after now, in eternity, with him forever. There will be suffering, but we do not suffer alone. In chapter 5, there's an exhortation to elders, and this would be for, for pastors to shepherd their flock and be examples to them. And then back to the theme of submission regarding younger people submitting to their elders and Peter closes with a word of warning and then then a word of encouragement that summarizes his entire message we find that in first Peter chapter 5 verses 6 to 11 and it says therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time casting all your care upon him for he cares for you be sober be vigilant 
because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. All right. Second Peter. Second Peter. Beware of false teachers. Second Peter is beware of false teachers. It's a much shorter book. And we're kind of getting to that part of the roller coaster where we're taking quick turns. Um, it's a shorter book, just three chapters. Um, if, if first Peter was speaking about dangers... Uh, from the outside, right, persecutions, then Second Peter is talking to us about dangers from the inside. Um, and, and not just from the inside of us individually, but from the inside of the church um, in terms of false teachers and false doctrine. So this, written, this is written a few years later, a few years after First Peter, um, around 68 AD. Uh, tradition has Peter dying at the hands of Caesar Nero during his great uh, persecution. Uh, the increase in suffering caused by the outside uh, persecution is now causing false teaching on the inside. Because anytime you have a, a people suffering, uh, in their suffering, they're willing to listen to just about anything that will give them some relief. And if you think about, um, you know, some of the the, the more you know, underdeveloped third world countries, and you wonder, you know, why do why do the people of those countries, you know, continue to you know to fall for, um, you know, governmental rule that is just keeping them down. And the truth is that they're just, they're just you know, falling for the lie that the next one is going to provide some relief. And that's what happened. In your suffering, you're willing to listen to just about anything that's going to give you some relief. And this is why suffering can be dangerous because you become susceptible if you are not grounded in the truth. Here in Second Peter, uh, he starts saying that we're in danger of falling away from the truth. And the best safeguard against this is maturity. I hope you guys are, are, are noticing um, certain themes that are just carrying across all of these books. Um, the best safeguard to falling away is growing in maturity, not staying where you are. Um, and, you know, some of you have, have heard me say this. I know I've, I've had this, this conversation uh, with some of you. Um, but, you know, I liken our, our walk with God kind of like walking up a down escalator. Um, you know, when my kids try to do that, I reprimand them. You know, um, but if you ever try to do it, it's kind of fun. But if you're walking up a down escalator, you're making progress. You might be not going as fast as you want to, but you're making uh, progress. As long as you're moving forward, you're going up. The second you stop, you're not staying still, right? The second you stop, that escalator starts to bring you down. So, you know, we need to press forward, continue to learn and grow. Uh, 2 Peter uh, 1, verses 5 to 10 says, But also for this very reason... Giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren... Be even more diligent to make your call an election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. This is a great list to check yourself against regarding your growth. And we also see that God does his part when we do ours. We can't just sit back and put our faith on cruise control and expect to grow. Um, in chapter 2 of Second Peter, he warns of false teachers, uh, reminding them that there are false prophets uh, that there were false prophets, you know, in the past, in the Old Testament. There are false teachers in the time of Jesus, and there are false teachers now in Rome. And for us, we need to be diligent and on guard as well. And the closing verse of Second Peter sums it up for us. Uh, the closing verses, uh, chapter 3, verses 14 to 18. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist 
to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. All right. Now, first, second, and third, John. Uh, first John is fellowship with John. Fellowship with John. John writes three books. Uh, these three books, first, second, and third John, he writes the Gospel of John, uh, which we already went over. And then he writes the book of Revelation as well. So he's the author of all five of those books. Um, this is the John that's a disciple of Christ. Uh, he's known by many different names. The Apostle, the, I mean the Apostle, he's, he's one of the sons of thunder, uh, which we've talked about. Um, he's also known as the one that Jesus loved. Uh, he was known as the elder because even though when he walked with Jesus, he was one of the youngest, just a teenager, right? He outlasts pretty much all the other disciples. So now he's much older. Uh, he's, he, so they call him the elder. Uh, the stories about him say that emperors tried to kill him. They made him drink poison and all these other things. And eventually he gets exiled to a small island called Patmos. Um, and it was in this island. This was an island for prisoners. And this is where he received the vision and wrote the book of Revelation. Uh, 1 John is thought by many to be the book, uh, the last book of the New Testament written, and again, chronologically. Um, John was old, close to 100 years old, and by this time, he was no longer a son of thunder. God had tempered him. He had changed him. So instead of son of thunder, he's the apostle of love. And as he writes uh, this, there's, there's something on his mind. He, he writes this letter, and it's almost like a grandfather writing a letter to, to, to a grandchild. Um, uh, but there's, you know, there's something on his mind. There's a false teaching, a false doctrine that's starting to grow inside the congregation around that time, 100 A.D. And it's called Gnosticism. You know, Pastor Bob talked about it a little bit last week. And it's basically the belief that the material world is evil. The spiritual world is good. Um, it derives its thinking from Plato, the philosopher. Uh, so you have this philosophical dual, you know, dualism um, that the material world is evil, spiritual world is good. Um, so it denied in some cases that Jesus had a physical body. Others described the physical body, but not the deity of Christ. So they generally denied that Jesus had a body of flesh or that he was a real person. So it was like he was a ghost or a phantom. So look at how John begins um, uh, this, you know, First John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. See, Christianity was a firsthand experience for John. Okay, Jesus wasn't a phantom. He, he had personal encounters with him. He lived with Jesus in the flesh for three and a half years. He heard, he saw, he touched. He was not a phantom. Uh, in verse 3, we read, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. So again, um, did I mention First John was fellowship with God? I did, right? Okay. All right. So we're going to talk about a little about fellowship with God. It means partnership, right? Fellowship means partnership. It means communion. It means community. We have something in common with God. And we have something in common with, with fellow believers, right? There's a strong family theme here. God is our Father. He's mine. He's yours. And guess what that makes us? Brothers and sisters. And one of the things that John does in this book is tell us why he's writing these things to us. And he will, he will literally say, these things I write to you. And, you know, there's three of them I want to point out in verse 4. These things I write to you that your joy may be full. John wants you to have fullness of joy because that's the message Jesus left with him. Uh, in, verse, in chapter 2, verse 1, these things I write to you that you may not sin. It says, my little children. See, this is, again, the feeling, that kind of a grandfatherly um, message. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours, but also for the whole world. Propitiation, that's another SAT word. All right, propitiation basically means satisfaction. What did Jesus satisfy? 
the wrath of God that was meant for us. See, the wrath of God, what Jesus endured on the cross, that's what was meant for us. He was the satisfaction of that. Um, this doesn't mean that you'll never mess up and that you never fail when he says, you know, so that you may not sin. But day to day, your lifestyle, your choices, sin will diminish as you walk with the Lord. And then uh, the third one, these things I have written to you that you may know you have eternal life. Uh, John, uh, 1 John 5.13, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of, the God, of God, that you may know you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. See, John wants you to have assurance, to be certain that you belong to him, that you are a child of God, that you have salvation. You don't have to wonder. Uh, you don't have to guess. Uh, you don't have to hope that you did enough, that you may know you have eternal life. And if you've ever, ever thought, Man, you know, am, am, am I just messing up too much? Listen, God always provides a way back. And this verse tells us that you may know the certainty of eternal life. All right, Second John. Second John is truth and love. Truth and love. It's addressed, um, uh, this one's addressed kind of awkwardly, weirdly. It's, a, it's addressed to the elect lady and her children. Um, it's an odd address. Um, some scholars take it literally that it was written to a particular woman and her children. Um, if, if, if you're looking at more of like a figurative interpretation, it could refer to a church and its, con and its congregation as, um, you know, the church was often referred to as the bride of Christ. Um, but uh, one of the reasons the church grew and spread during the first century was the hospitality of the early Christians, right? Um, we see examples like the Apostle Paul being able to travel and depend on Christians opening their homes to him. Uh, in Galatians 6, we, um, he also encouraged Christians to support those who are teachers of good things. Um, John even commends and encourages those uh, who provided support and places uh, to stay for, for the traveling missionaries. So this hospitality also creates created opportunities for false teachers and doctrines to find their way into the church. And Second John addresses this issue. And it does this by encouraging brotherly love and the keeping of the commandments of God. And we see that in uh, 2 John 1, 5 through 6. And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that you have heard from the beginning. You should walk in it. Okay, so again, he's addressing this issue with this encouragement. But now he provides this warning against supporting or encouraging false teachers. And we read in 2 John 1, 10 through 11, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive them into your house nor greet them. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. And as far as the false teachers, verse 7 might suggest that they were likely precursors to the Gnostics we spoke about in 1 John. Uh, we read in verse uh, 7 of 2 John, For many deceivers have gone out in the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So that's 2 John. Um, 3 John. 3 John, imitate what is good. Imitate what is good. And again, these last few books, they're, they're one chapter. Um, they're short letters. Uh, but third, John, imitate what is good. This is a letter that John writes to a man named Gaius. Um, it's a very short letter, really, um, uh, really related to three men that it mentions uh, by name. The first is Gaius, and, and, and John confirms that uh, he did right in supporting the teachers that came his way, and he encourages them to continue in that hospitality. Uh, the second man that's mentioned is um, Diotrephes who he condemns for rejecting John and others who he should have received. And then the third one is Demetrius, who he commends as a good example to follow. In uh, um, uh, 3 John 1, 11, we read, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. All right. And then last but not least is Jude, the book of Jude. And Jude, uh, the overarching theme is contend for the faith. Contend for the faith. Jude is also the brother of Jesus, or half-brother of, of Jesus. And like James, uh, he didn't believe his brother was the Messiah either um, until after the resurrection. 
Um, in Jude, we are called to, to bear arms, spiritually speaking, to put up a good fight for the faith, right, to contend for the faith. And again, we see a common thread of warning the church against false teachers, against apostates. Um, in, Jude, uh, in Jude, verses 3 to 4, it says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, uh, which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ, right? I mean, he starts, you know, Jude, he just, he was like, man, I also write you guys like a little devotional, you know, a good word, right? He wanted to write about the salvation they shared as believers, but then he had to change his message. And in this short letter, He's talking to these guys in, in the local area because they are being infiltrated by false teachers. We read that these wolves um, have, um, have snuck into the church. Uh, they were twisting the grace of God, denying truths about Jesus, and claiming that their personal revelations were superior to Scripture, and their lives were marked by lawless behavior, uh, being ruled by their passions, and being characterized by arrogant pride. And... Um, and he gives kind of a formula for how Christians can protect themselves. Um, and verse 20, it's not in your notes, but if you want to make a note just of verse 20, um, how Christians kind of can protect themselves. Jude says this in verse 20. He's, he says you can, you can protect yourself by, you know, build yourself up in your most holy faith. Second, pray in the Holy Spirit. And third, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting expectantly for the mercy of Jesus for eternal life. And we get back to the idea of living with eternity in mind. And Jude also challenges us to love all people enough to tell them the truth. And that is a hard challenge. You love someone enough to tell them the truth because sometimes um, the truth the truth is going to hurt. Um, but if you love someone, you will tell them the truth. In Jude 1, uh, 24 to 25, it's the last verse we're going to read tonight. It says, Not a him who was able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. See, God has all the attributes, the position, and the legitimate right to get you through whatever challenges confront you and the sin and decay in the world around you. And that is the general epistles of the New Testament. Um, let's pray together. Father, we thank you. Uh, we thank you again for your word, for your instruction. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for um, those that came before us, um, that in obedience, um, Lord, uh, were led by you, um, that provide us a wisdom and knowledge of you. Um, pray, Lord, that um, if anything, Lord, this would just spark a desire to, to go deeper into your word and to know you more intimately, to know you better. Um, Lord, that our, our words of wanting a relationship with you would turn into action, that we would take the necessary steps to, uh, to invest time, energy, resources, uh, our hearts and minds surrender to you um, in the study of your word, Lord God, just for the purpose of, of knowing you better. Lord, you are our Father. Um, you have so much for us, Lord, so much for us to discover about you. Um, so I put that desire in our hearts, Lord, uh, that it would be a, a flame that burns um, to learn more about you, Lord. Uh, so we thank you. Uh, we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.